The Oregonian calls Will Durst a hilarious stand-up journalist. He is one of my comedy heroes. I saw him playing Berkeley back in the 80s at a club called Pizzuto's. Pizzuto's? Pizzuto's with Rob Becker. You're just making stuff up. Now. You and Rob Becker. Pizzuto's. Pizzuto's. Defending the caveman, Rob Becker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a man worth almost $100 million. Seriously? Yeah. yeah. From Togo's? Togo's, and he sold Defending the Caveman to a theater alliance in Iceland. So all those, wherever you see Defending the Caveman being done in community theater, a little one-man show, or in Vegas, or that's owned by the ice. he sold the whole thing. Let me tell you about our friend Rob Becker, who we started with yeah, yeah. back in San Francisco at the Holy City. Middle Zoo. 80s, yeah, early 80s. He was sitting at home one night, and David Letterman called him and said, I just saw you on Evening at the Improv. Come do my show. I think that's the only time Letterman ever called anybody wow. and said, come do my show. Here's something about Rob Becker, and I invited him to do my show, but he didn't know what he wanted to talk about. I think he's kind of, if he's got $100 million, he's doing the right thing. <laughs> not I, doing your show? Not doing my show. Yeah. I don't think he... He might be the second richest comic after Seinfeld. Hmm. Yeah. Let me just get depressed for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what that look on your face was. <laughs> $100 million. It was like you had just... Swallowed some sort of really hot, tasty pepper that was dipped in. <laughs> <laughs> 1994, 95, Defending the Caveman comes to New York City. Yeah, yeah. I was playing Caroline's, and Rob says to me, Can you come to the opening? I said, I can't. He says, Well, can you come to the after party? Sure. I knew that he was making a fortune before he came to the Helen Hayes Theater here in New York City. So I wasn't really rooting for the guy. I'm young, competitive. I want him to fail because we started together. I don't really mean that. Yeah, you do. A little. Yeah. It's yeah. not funny if I'm a yeah. sweet guy trying to no. root for my friend. Where? I, I don't remember. Restaurant near the Helen Hayes. Yes. And so it, would, it wasn't in a lobby of the no, Helen No, it was or... a fancy, okay. fancy, fancy party. And it was like something out of All About Eve. And I'm standing there. And they're waiting for the bulldog edition of the newspapers to come out to read really? the reviews. This really? is 1995, 94, yeah, 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 when yeah. people waited for the newspapers yeah, to yeah. come off the truck to read the reviews. And Clive Barnes from the New York Post headline review. This caveman is stupid. Wow. And I'm standing next to Rob Becker. Wow. And my knees buckle. And I realize, you know what? As much as I enjoy people's yeah yeah pain and but misery. now now I'm getting no, it. No, no no and then the the right. reviews were really bad. Correct me if I'm wrong, but somebody said the reviews were bad, and the wife of one of the critics went to the show, and the husband wrote a scathing review, and the wife said no, I liked it, and so she wrote. A review in response to her husband. Wow. Yeah. And that got printed. And then John Gray got involved. Men are from Mars, women are mm -hmm. from Venus guy. Yeah. And I think that's how it took off. I heard that story. I don't know if it's apocryphal or if it's true. Well, God bless him because I could not have survived that night. And it became the longest running one man show on Broadway. Yeah. He surpassed Whoopi. Everybody's one man show uh, with yeah. the bad reviews. So, yeah, Shecky Green. Uh, <laughs> Shecky Green's one man show. Persistence. Anyway, so I saw you at Pizzuto's, and this is the joke uh -oh. that I remember thinking, I want to be this guy when I heard you tell this joke. Diane Feinstein was the mayor of San Francisco, and she had just come out against gun control. This was the 80s. And Will said. If it weren't for gun control, she'd still be a supervisor. <laughs> Oh, come on, because the audience would groan. Come on. I was on Twinkies when I wrote that joke. Because <laughs> that was a famous Twinkie defense. That, uh, uh -huh. If you want to understand that joke, go back and look up George Moscone, Harvey Milk, Dan White, and I promise you, you'll go down a rabbit hole of yucks. Yeah. She'd still be a supervisor. That was such a great joke. And 
One night, I still had that joke in my repertoire, and I'm doing some fancy gig. And a friend of mine who owned Tosca Theater on uh, Columbus. In San Francisco. In San Francisco. She said, uh, you know, Gina Moscone's in the audience. Because she sounded just like uh, Mitzi Shore. Gina Moscone's in the audience. I don't think you should do that, Joe. <laughs> and she saved me from huge embarrassment. Because yeah. the widow of the mayor who was shot by Dan White before he shot Harvey Milk. Right. And that's the famous Dan, uh, never mind, we've over Well, Dan White was the supervisor, yeah. and yeah. we got to quote Rudy Weeb Reber's joke. Oh, which is? Oh, Larry Brown loved this joke. Dan White was the supervisor yeah, who, yeah. who shot and killed yeah, yeah. all these politicians. And then got off on the Twinkie defense. He got off on the Twinkie defense. They rioted in the Castro. Yeah, as well they should have. Yeah. He had, what, low blood sugar that day, and that's why? I have no. So he was a homophobe. He killed Harvey Milk, who was the most... Yeah, he was uh, just a blue-collar guy. This was, you know, 78, and uh, homophobia was still something that blue-collar guys, you know, clung to. I mean, it was the whole locker room. Right. Make fun of uh, people who are less than. And Dan White resigned his seat in response, and then he asked for it back. And they said, no, Moscone said, no, I'm not going to give you your seat back. And uh, he blamed Moscone and then uh, Harvey Milk. And that's why he, he killed him. Right. And he was, I'm setting up Rudy Reber's joke. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> it's a funny joke. Oh, it's horrible. You got to know that Dan White, Twinkie defense guy, was a homophobe. Yeah, yeah. And he ended up killing himself. By, After being, yeah, getting out of prison. Right. And he killed himself by turning the car engine on in the garage. And he died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh -huh. And Rudy Reber said, how ironic that Dan White should die sucking on a pipe. Because he was a homophobe. And I remember Larry Brown and I thought that was the funniest joke in the world. I consider Will Durst... Hose? Wouldn't hose be funnier? Maybe I'm not doing the joke justice. <laughs> the same way the killer of Harvey Milk was not done justice. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You snatched uh, victory from the jaws of defeat. Yeah, no matter how tight the dental opening. <laughs> I consider Will Durst the premier political satirist in the country for two reasons. Randy Credico is going to prison and Barry Crimmins is dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Uh, Barry is laughing. Yeah, I know Barry's yeah. laughing at. That. He yeah, that's it. also that's also uh, you missed uh, Jim Morris. I yeah. don't know whatever happened to him. Jimmy Tingle. Yeah, did he uh, get elected lieutenant governor of Massachusetts? No, he didn't. No. no, but it was it wasn't a runaway. It was like. It was within 12 points, you yeah. know, which is, isn't bad for a comedian. Right. Yeah. He went to the Harvard School of Government like 10 years ago. He graduated from the Harvard School of Government. Good for him. Yeah. And Jim Morris, one of the great impersonators. Yes, yes. Uh, got famous for his Reagan impression. And then afterwards, he did a halfway decent G.H.W. Bush, but it wasn't. there wasn't the same calling because Dana Carvey sucked all the oxygen out right. of that room. But Jim Morris did the funniest joke ever in Europe. What? Yep. Reagan was planting short-range nuclear missiles in, I think, Camiso, somewhere in Western Europe. There were 500,000 Greens protesting in Berlin. Ronald Reagan's decision to plant these short-range... No nukes. Yeah. No nukes. And... He was the definitive Ronald Reagan impersonator. And in front of 500,000 people, the host goes, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Boo. 500,000 people are booing Jim as Ronald. In Berlin? In Berlin. And when the boos finally die down, he goes, well, you people are un-American. <laughs> 
<laughs> and the place erupted with cheers. Yes, we are. That's funny. I didn't yeah. know that. Hey, so we're over at the the Playroom Theater where people... And, sh- it's, and it's right here. It's Times Square adjacent. It's uh, right next to the TGI Fridays and the Havana Central. So <laughs> on the eighth floor. It's a gorgeous little space, isn't it? Yeah, 151 West 46th Street. There's the physics show that they do here. You should go to thatphysicshow.com and find out what else is going on over here at the Playroom Theater where you just finished up. I finished up a two-week run. What is the name of your what new one-man show? You have so many. Durst Case Scenario Midterm Madness. That was the final version of it, the final iteration, because the midterms are over. Can you stand a compliment? Because I just watched it. I just saw yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You, you stayed for the whole 80 minutes. Not a piece of fat on the bone. It yeah, went, but I whittled it down. I, I mean, so I great, so well written, so well performed. Sixteen months whittling. So it down. many arrows in your quiver, amazing. A lot and of jokes. Lo- you really got to see it twice to get all the jokes. Yes, and informative, and inspirational. Are Americans taking Trump too seriously? Because I watched you tonight. I have never seen you so angry. You said in the show that you used to skewer both sides yeah skewer both sides you call trump an asshole you literally called him an asshole but he is yeah and the audience gets into it yeah are you lock him up see how quick that happened how genuinely mad are you of trump because i am not mad at trump i'm mad at the people who, who enable him like the democrats no he's he's trying to ruin america he has no respect for tradition or, or anything. No, I'm, I'm pissed at him. And you don't blame Kelly and Mattis and all the people who... All the enablers? Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he's the main one. He doesn't listen to them. He does whatever he wants. McConnell, George Herbert Walker Bush, George W. Bush, Cheney, Clinton, all the gray eminences of our culture... Washington, D.C. not saying, wait, 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 this has to stop. Yeah, I don't get it. I mean, if I'm this pissed, what about Obama? What about, you know, his legacy being torn? I mean, this guy is shredding American tradition. And, and I mean, uh, we, we didn't realize, you know, what halcyon days George W. Bush and Dick Cheney were, the, the Cheney administration, we don't realize. And, and this guy, and what are they doing? What are they doing? What, do, what is Obama doing? He made a deal with Netflix, for Christ's <laughs> sake. That's his response. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pissed at everybody. I'm pissed at everybody. Well, to Obama's credit. I don't credit, care anymore. Obama campaigned. I, he went out on the stump and campaigned against him in the midterms. They, sh- they should be setting his toes on fire is what they should be doing. But it's the responsibility. They should be calling in favors from Mark Burnett, from anybody who's got dirt on this guy, and they should be releasing it on a daily basis. They should they, they do whatever you can. You, you fight, lie, cheat, steal, just like he does. Well, so far, is he as bad as W? Yeah. Yeah. W it's, was pretty bad. It's coarsening. Yeah. W had a tradition. Yeah. But that tradition was used to but get this us... this coarsening of, of America, allowing people to uh, yell at kids and, uh, and people of a different color or different sexual, they just feel free, and uh, they're, they're just, yeah, the assholization of America. Well, the aesthetic is bad, but the facts on the ground... I, I'm not defending Trump... But W, by now, the World Trade Center had come down within two years of his presidency. No, the first year. I'm just saying, we were on the our... The first year. I know. Yeah. We were on our way into Iraq, and... Yeah, that... Well, he personally, George W., was personally in deep shit September of 2001, because the whole Kenny Lay, Kenny Boy, mm-hmm. that was... Uh, the Enron thing was happening, and uh, his... His approval rating was way down, just like Trump's was. Yeah. And then 9-11 happened, and then you had a rally behind the president. And that lasted for four years. 
that lasted until Katrina. And by that time, uh, everybody kind of was done with him. And uh, he was done with Cheney. So that was, that was interesting. Yeah, he tried to be his own man for his last couple of years. You say you're the canary in the coal mine. I do. You're the premier political satirist. No, I'm not the premier. You are. I'm, I'm the guy who writes his own material, though. Yeah. I am that guy. Yes. I was going to make, I was going to insult you and go, that's obvious. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that those guys, you know, I mean, that's a tough gig in itself, seeing that material the third or fourth time and doing it in front of a national audience. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a certain skill too. Also relying on the writers and, and working with them and stuff. Well, they give the job of political satirist on television specifically to performers who are not political satirists. That tends to be the case with television. The networks will never give the job of political satirists to someone who really cares about politics. And I, I think Bill Maher, grew into a political satirist, but I think originally he was just trying to find a way in to get on The Tonight Show by any means necessary. And he was interested in politics, but that wasn't his calling card until politically incorrect. And the same applies to Dennis Miller and Jon Stewart. Colbert's an amazing guy. He's a true political satirist, with or without writers. Same applies to Bill Maher. Bill Maher grew into a political satirist with gravitas. But for the most part, they're not going to put a real political satirist on television. Huh. You need to take somebody young and groom them so they will tow the party line. I was young at one time. Well, yeah, but you weren't going to tow the party line. But I hit both sides. I don't think there's much of a difference between Trump and Bush. And I think Bush is more dangerous than Trump. And what you said during your show is all Trump did was lift the rock up and show us what's underneath yeah, the yeah. Republican Party. He's ruining the Republican Party. No, he just lifted the rock they were hiding under. Yeah. It's always been there. Yeah, yeah. The racist, sexist, the, the kowtowing to the rich. That's always been their party. And then they suck up to the, the God people. And that's mostly with the abortions, because they don't care about abortions. And if you go they back... They don't care about poor women. Yeah. If you go back 14 years to 2004, Bush and Cheney were running for re-election. And what got people to the polls was this constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage. Now, I'm not saying Trump isn't inciting gay bashing and shooting up synagogues he, he most certainly is but we're not living the way we were 14 years ago we were at war illegally they were manipulating we're still war still get troops in Iraq yeah but if you don't pay attention to it we're not <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right it is kind of a back burner thing terror code and the the way oh, they, yeah yeah the they color would, code they would scare us before an election. Do you remember that? What was it? Yeah, yeah, they would do that too. Yeah. I mean, think about that. Like, like Trump did. They always do that. These midterms were pretty tame. Except for the, you know, the immigrant thing, which apparently I'll is, take, is one. You'll take immigrant invasion over terrorist invasion? Anytime. I'll take the caravan over Bush and Cheney warning of imminent terror. Our threat level was burgundy. <laughs> I mean that was pretty that was pretty horrible what they did. Yeah. I mean a lot worse than the caravan. I don't know if it was worse than the caravan. I think it's raising the threat level of national security. It was just them convincing the right people that their focus should be on something that it had nothing to do with them, you know, against their better self-interests. That's all. It was the same thing. Not defending Trump. Yeah, you are. Well, <laughs> well, let's move on. You never stop. You never stop. You, you write a nationally syndicated column, books, radio and television commentaries. The New York Times calls you possibly the best. They said that in 1987. They said that in 1987. Yeah. They also said Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> 
Fox News has called you a great political satirist? That was my last show here, the All-American Sport of Bipartisan Bashing. I did that in 2007 at the end of uh, the second Bush reign of error. And you got high praise from the Fox News Network. Yeah, it's only because I went on their little show. No, well, that means a lot. I mean, that's where Jesse Waters and Greg Gutfeld are considered the reincarnation of Dorothy Parker and Robert Benchley. So that's that's the show I was on. I was on <laughs> Red Eye, but I was also on Fox News Radio. Yeah, I did a lot. You know, they always they say stuff like that. You know, to make them look good, not to make me look good. Your writing has appeared in Esquire, the San Francisco Chronicle, National Lampoon, the New York Times. George, did you meet John F. Kennedy Jr.? I was that close. That close. Because it was uh, the Republican convention in San Diego. He was my editor and I was covering it for George. That was his magazine? Yeah, it was his magazine. John John. And he's coming in and he's shaking hands and the Secret Service is there. And he's shaking hands before he's about to go off to the event inside the zoo at the San Diego Zoo. So he's shaking hands, and the Secret Service guy sees me standing there, and I'm wearing jeans and a sport coat. And, you know, I look like this, pretty much. You know, I'm not wearing the suits and stuff. And he sees me, and he stands right in front. It's my boss. I'm writing for George Magazine, and, and he won't let me shake hands. The Secret Service it just stands right in front of me, and wow. I let him reach my hand around, and John doesn't see it. And but that was uh, that was uh, the event where I went to the bathroom and crossed trails with Norman Mailer. Wow! Yeah, you peed next to I peed. No, no, we actually crossed trails because <laughs> <laughs> Norman Mailer was drunk. <laughs> was he drunk? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. National Lampoon. You've been nominated for five Emmys. You've been fired by the PBS three times. Three times. PBS, sense of humor, not a match. The board goes back. And you, for the PBS, have covered unions and the working man. You have always been... There was a show in the Bay Area. It started in the Bay Area. Uh, And then it became California Working. And then it was up and down the state, all the PBS stations. And then it became We Do the Work... And that was nationally syndicated. And then we did another show called Livelihood, and that was nationally syndicated. And we did about four years of Livelihood, doing four shows a year. I'm going to ask you a tough question, because I've known you since 1982. Yeah, 36 years. Yeah. You come from a union background. I don't know what your father did, but I know that you... He was a machinist. You grew up in Wisconsin. I'm a third-generation factory rat. My grandpa, my dad... I, a couple of aunts and uncles, some cousins, my mom and my stepmom all worked at a tractor factory called Alice Chalmers. And you grew up in a union hall. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, my dad was a steward. Yeah. And you have a background in respecting the union. Yeah. yeah. Why? I'm going to ask you a tough question. Is it my imagination during the Reagan years, I kind of remember you softening a little on unions no i just don't believe in patronage jobs i think also a union only kept me from getting a a job in after they never helped me get a job but i understand uh, and people are finding out now the power and of a union only when they're missing it right you know that's the problem i can remember right to work my in the 80s When we were doing comedy, it was okay to crap on union. People would go on stage, not tell a joke, and go, what? It's a union job. I don't have to make you laugh. I did a thing uh, on Facebook the other day. I did uh, comedy club memes. How do you, how do you, things you only hear at comedy clubs. And not, I'm not talking heckle lines. That's not fair. But, uh, oh, just put that anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's you only hear at a comedy club. Bob Hope. From a movie where he plays a cartoonist. Oh, really? Yep. Just put that anywhere. Yeah. Somebody uh, drops something. That's, that that's going to leave a mark. Mm-hmm. That's that's a comedy uh, club. Oh, so I stabbed him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's way back. We're dating now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and These are all these stuff. Comics and comics, a lot of us had 
one or more of these or different versions. And and she was the town prostitute. (laughs) And that was the women. That was the women, (laughs) right. Unions were incredibly strong. I can remember working in television, and there was a time when you could not move a chair in a studio. If somebody moved a chair, production would shut down. But what happened? Uh, that guy over there moved a chair. So yeah, I don't know if it was that. It was. Tight. Oh yes, know. it was. Right. You right. weren't allowed to put your hand over the Grass Valley switcher in the control room. You weren't allowed to wave your hand over the buttons, the knobs that switch cameras back and forth. Okay, I believe you. In the '60s and the '50s, the unions were strong enough, and I think this is a great thing. People are going to say, See, I don't like the feather bedding jobs. I don't like the fact that, uh, you know, when technology makes stuff easier, that you can't get rid of any of the people. I don't like that. I think it gives unions a bad name. Let me tell you what used to go on in New York City. In television in the 50s and the 60s. I think it happened in the 70s, all the way up through the 80s and probably stopped in the 80s. If you had a television show, you would build a set Nothing from that set could be used on any other television show. And after that show was done, you had to burn the set and rebuild a brand new set for the next television show. That was the power of unions. And I suspect back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you had a lot of Greatest Generation guys who came back from the war and they were perfectly okay with that. They totally got it. They totally understood what it means to be taken advantage of. And there's nothing wrong with a union taking advantage of You know, it's funny that you bring up the fact of what happened in show business. Because when we were starting to get into show business, we couldn't get jobs down in L.A. Because it was all the old graybeards who had the jobs. All the writers for the comedy shows were all in their 50s, 60s, and, and more. And, and they wouldn't hire us young punks. And yet, when we got there, and we were starting to be about the same age as what they were, then they wanted all the young people. <laughs> then they wanted all the kids. No, 28, you're too old, no. Right. So we, we got caught that little that little gap period there, yeah. Well, they deserved it, our dads. They went off and fought in World War II. That was a good war, though. And they deserved a free ride after that, (laughs) as long as they were white. They lived through the Depression and the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and willing to be filmed in black and white. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Were they the greatest generation? We have no idea. Everybody, oh, yeah, it was a wonderful time. I want my 50s back. No, you don't. The right. food sucked. You know, yeah. chock full of nuts was the best <laughs> coffee you could buy. You know, I mean, no, you don't want the 50s back, especially if you're gay or or a female or a minority or or a, a farm worker or, or somebody who worked in a factory where, uh, you know, they didn't have protections. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want to be. You don't want the fifties back. No, there's so many reasons, but people have that, you know, sepia toned memory of everything they saw. And uh, Father knows best, leaving it to Beaver. What do we do about white men in this country? It's a problem. Their time is over. You say that, but I don't care. I'm not a white nationalist by any stretch of the imagination. You're a Jew. I know, but. <laughs> They hate you. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be. <laughs> That's the only thing I have in common with them. <laughs> so many Jews. Joining white nationalists. We got something in common. <laughs> That's a great joke. But not to address the plight of white men in this country is a mistake. Because they are suffering. They are addicted to opiates. They, they're, their suicide rates are up. Their poverty levels are up. Trump has tapped into something that our side is ignoring, and it's not helping us. I mean, imagine being a white male in his 40s, his 30s. How would you feel? What, seeing all of your uh, entitlements uh, being chewed around the edges by 
by the rats of minorities and women and gays. Tough. Yeah, I see. That's the problem. Tough. You mean that? Tough. Deal with it. And Move they on. Are, and they Move are on. dealing with it. Yeah, by voting for Trump? Yeah. That's not new. That's not new. That's always that 35% of people who are against science and are just clinging to religion. Remember clinging to religion and guns? Remember Obama saying that? That's, in Pennsylvania. You know, in, in 1956, after Senator Joe McCarthy had been censored by the Senate, after he had fallen into total disgrace and been discredited by papers and, and, and politicians and, and abandoned by all of his allies, he still had a 35% approval rating. <laughs> It's never going to go away. And he still does. And Coulter's still defending him. White men are a problem in this country. No, no. no. White men have always been a problem in this country. Okay. That, that's, I agree with you. I agree. And, that, and that's... It's not the future. They're not the future. No. Yeah. So they're, now they're getting guns and Christianity, tattoos, and shaving their head, voting for Trump holding tiki torches, and say you won't replace us. Can you understand? I know Obama could. Don't you think St. Obama would know to address this issue of the disenfranchised white male? So you think Democrats are ignoring the present, focus too much on Texas and California turning blue? Because the whole world, the whole world follows California. California is the petri dish of social change. And right now, uh, California doesn't have a single Republican in office. Not one. Oh, yes, they do. Couple. McCarthy? Yeah. Uh, Kevin McCarthy. Majority leader? Yeah. Uh, but M- minority in, in leader. State, in statewide. Yeah, minority. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's ironic. Yeah. But uh, and a couple and, in and Devin Valley. Nunes is Republican. Did he did he win? Nunes? I think Devin Nunes won. Oh, I thought he lost. Really? I thought he did. I don't know. I don't think so. Oh. Now you live in California. I, li- I I swear to God, it is the wave of the future, California. So we're all going to be on fire. <laughs> I don't. I have two friends who lost their homes. Oh my God! Terrible divorce. Really bad. <laughs> Sorry. Enforced. Yeah, yeah, I had to send Debbie home. We bought some face masks here because they're all out in the Bay Area. Yeah, and so, you're going as Michael Jackson for yeah. Costume. Beat it, let's just beat it. Talk to me about California. Jerry Brown is retiring. Gavin Newsom is the new governor of California. Tell me about Gavin Newsom, and tell me about he's beautiful. Tell me about Jerry Brown. He. Got the sense of humor of an end table. (laughs) He is the 34th and 39th governor of California. And he's going to be the 45th. Really? Oh, yeah. He's going to be. He was governor when he was 36, and he was governor when he's 72. So he's going to be governor every 36 years. (laughs) He's going to be governor when he's 108. He's part locust. Yeah, yeah. he'll just be a head in a jar. There's something. Is he the greatest California politician ever? He's focused. And he's did got, you ever meet him? He's got uh, a couple times. I'm serious. He has the sense of humor of an end table. We were on a show one time when he wasn't governor, when he be, between running for president. I think he sold it his 800 number. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And we were on a show, Channel 5. It was election night. I think it was the midterms of uh, 98. And we were on a show. And it was him and me and Jackie Spire. Congresswoman, Jack. Con- well, this I don't know if she was Assembly Congresswoman woman. yet. She's no, uh, yeah, I don't. And there was another guy, a, a pundit. And it might have been Mervyn Field. But there was the four of us, so they would do election returns for 20 minutes. And then they do, you know, people at uh, the victory parties for five minutes. And then they come to us in the studio, and we would all comment on what was going on. 
and everybody got one line. And of course, my line, I tried to come up with a joke about whatever was going on. And uh, they kept going to Jerry Brown, and he kept trying to filibuster and just go on and on and mm-hmm. on. And, and they kept going, oh, we can't do that. Finally, Jerry, Jerry, we got to go. So uh, we'll be back in another half hour. So uh, he looks at me, he's uh, I, they won't let me talk. I said, we're just the dancing monkeys here. You know, we're just, we're just jumping through the hoops of fire. And he looked at me and he went, you're right. We're just dancing monkeys. <laughs> and he got up and he laughed. Really? <laughs> and, and the director said, what did you say to him? And I said, well, I just said we were just dancing monkeys. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> we're here in Manhattan. You and I met in San Francisco. You still live in San Francisco. I do, and you still live in uh, Manhattan. I live in Manhattan. I've come full circle. I can't decide who I hate more, the people of San Francisco or the people of Manhattan. High rents, nobody but the rich can live here, or the very young who know they can eventually move, or the very old who can't move. Do people have to live in San Francisco or Manhattan? Is that necessary? Shouldn't we just shut down Manhattan and San Francisco? Manhattan gave us Trump. San Francisco gave us Pelosi. Isn't that what's wrong with this country? San Francisco and Manhattan? Shouldn't yeah. we just shut it down? Yeah. No, we should nuke them. <laughs> just nuke them. It's not just Manhattan and San Francisco. This is happening all over the country. Austin is becoming prohibitively expensive. Chicago, L.A. is on the verge, only it's so spread out. You know, there's always some room to move. But Manhattan and San Francisco, that's limited space. You know, Oakland has become the new Brooklyn, but not even Brooklyn can maintain the... It's Brooklyn-ness now. So people are moving to Queens and, you know, Staten Island. And I think it's going to happen in all the secondary cities like Kansas City and Milwaukee. And, and Staten Island just went blue. They really? Just, first time in decades that they have a Democrat now. Yeah, because of the young people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think it's going to – It's uh, America is changing. It's in the midst of huge changes. And I think it's going to be Detroit and, and Minnesota. Coming back. And, and – Cincinnati. Coming know. back. Yeah. That's, Young people that's, are going to move there because it's yeah, affordable. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. because of uh, fiber optics, uh, Kansas City made the whole the whole area fiber optics. You know, I think Detroit's going to do it. So, yeah, I think that's where all the new incubators of art and, and big ideas are going to come. There are no big ideas coming from Manhattan. Everybody here is rich or the, the child of a rich person. Off with their heads. Not the child of a rich person, the child of a person who owns a home. And that became rich. You know, it's like San Francisco. All the kids of all the people who owned houses, and these were middle class people who bought their house for, you know, $30,000 in 1974. Now that house is worth $1.4 million, and the kids are rich. But they still have, you know, their blue collar roots. But they vote. To protect the value of their home. Well, there's not a lot of times that comes up. We'll see next in 2020 because they're going to put Prop 13 on the ballot. Is San Francisco creatively dead? The answer is yes. <laughs> we agree to disagree. Is it still thriving? Is it still vital? How can it be? Th- how can Manhattan and San Francisco have a thriving artistic community? If only the rich or the children of the rich can live there. Well, I live in the Sunset District, you know, which is not the city of San Francisco. It's the county of San Francisco, out by the Sunset and the Richmond, out by Golden Gate Park. You know, it's a different thing. It's a different thing. I don't know about thriving art scene. Is there a center to San Francisco, a community? Is there a place where people gather? Is North Beach still alive where you can sit in a bar? at City Lights, read. It seems to me every time I go back to San Francisco, there are fewer and fewer places. We lose the touch zones, yeah. To we, hang out, but, no community. But that's true of any town. That was true of San Francisco when I moved there in 1979. Herb Cain was bemoaning the fact that all the old icons were, were being torched and uh, you know, no longer But where do you there. gather? Huh? Where do you go? I hang out at home. <laughs> We still go out. I, I, we eat at the same six restaurants, you know, that we used to. Still, I'm old. 
You're not old. I'm, well, I don't act old. I don't have kids. You know, you act old. I'm old. You are old. I don't feel yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at that age now and I'm having fewer wet dreams and more solid ones. <laughs> Will Durst. That's me. WillDurst.com. WillDurst.com. And tell us what you're doing for New um, Year's. Uh, we do, a, every New Year's, we do a, a little tour from the day after Christmas until the end of the first weekend of the New Year. And it's called the Big Fat Year End Kiss Off Comedy Show. This will be the 26th annual, and it's me and Deb and Mike and Mari Magaloni and Johnny Steele and Arthur Gauss, and we do skits and sketches and stand-up all based on the year's uh, people and events. So go to willdurst.com to find out more. God bless you. Let me just hit the record button and we'll start. <laughs> <laughs>